right, hello everybody. So today we're going to continue doing your notes. So make sure you have your note packet out, ready to go over. Tomorrow we're gonna do, I believe, a lab. So be ready for that. Um, it'll be quite interesting. So today we'll be covering what's going to be on the lab. Uh, we're also gonna go over your black body radiation worksheet. So make sure that you have that done, ready to go over uh, tomorrow as well after the lab. Okay, so black body diagram and the sun is 6,000 Kelvin. So radiation law, this is it illustrated. It's also similar to what your worksheet for black body diagrams looks like. So it's a graph that shows in arbitrary units how many photons are given off at each wavelength for an object at four different temperatures. So the wavelength corresponds to the visible light are shown by the colored bands. Note that the hotter temperatures, more energy, in the form of photons is emitted at all wavelengths. The higher the temperature, the shorter the wavelength at which the peak amount of energy is radiated, which we also know as Wayne's Law. Uh, so you can see here, we have our different peaks. And again, depending on how much energy is there, is gonna dictate uh, what temperature they're gonna be shown or what color they'll be shown. So this one, you can see the more blue purple color has a shorter wavelength because it has a higher temperature has more energy to it. The green is at 5,000 Kelvin. The orangey yellow is 4,000. And then the less energy, 3,000 Kelvin is gonna show more red. So again, depending on where that peak wavelength is or the peak of the wavelength um, is gonna tell you basically what kind of light is going to be shown at a certain time. Okay, so here's a quick video this talks about the size of the star, the color, and its life cycle. What do you see when you look at the night sky? What do you see when you look at the Depending night sky? Depending on where you live, you see Depending mostly stars. You live, you see if you, mostly look stars. you look at the sky without a telescope, you see white stars, maybe some faintly blue, or even some sometimes some yellow or orange, orange ones. ones. The color depends on the star's surface the temperature. The color depends on the star's For example, temperature. our sun's surface example, temperature is about 6,000 Kelvin. Is about 6, Although, it Kelvin. Although it looks yellow from Earth, the light of the sun would actually look very white if we were in this space. This white light coming off the sun this is because its temperature is 6,000 Kelvin. If the sun were cooler, it would give off light more in the red range, and if the sun were hotter, it would look more blue. The coolest stars in the universe are the red dwarf stars. These are very tiny stars. Some are the tiniest, tiny stars, so they don't some burn the as hot, and their, so and their surface temperature is only 3,500 Kelvin. The light they give off looks mostly red to us. Red is also the color you see red with red giant the stars, you see with huge red giant stars that ran out of hydrogen fuel and bloated up many times their original size. The luminosity of the star is spread out over the much larger surface area of the red giant, making this star cooler than other large stars. On the opposite end of the color spectrum, are the blue the stars. Spectrum, are These the blue stars, stars are giants and hypergiants, much, hyper much, much bigger than the sun, and also much, much hotter, between 10,000 and 40,000 Kelvin. 10, Kelvin. For us on Earth, though, for most stars, stars in the sky, though, except for the brightest ones, appear white or bluish white because they don't emit enough light for our eyes to see color. Scientists have been studying stars for a long time, and over time they have learned to tell a lot about a star just by determining its temperature. Temperature and, and atmospheric pressure. The temperature tells them the surface brightness the of the star, and the, and the pressure, tells them, the the pressure star, tells them an approximate size of the star, which tells them whether the star is a giant, a dwarf, a giant, or, something a dwarf or something in These between. These two measurements taken together can often give information on the star's age and distance from the Earth. Scientists like to organize and classify things. They developed a classification system called the Spectral Code and have used it since 1943. To those who can read it, the Spectral Code tells just what kind of an object a star really is, its color, size, and luminosity compared to other stars, in addition to its peculiarities, history, and future. Let's learn a bit of the classification Let's system. Learn a bit of the classification Scientists system. classify stars by Scientists temperature and the elements they absorb, which are called their spectra. They, they have divided stars into seven main types. There are seven main types of stars. There are seven main o, types of stars. B, A, o, F, G, A, K, and M. G, K, the O and stars M. are the bright, hot the blue stars, stars the bright, and the M stars, stars are the dimmer, cooler the red stars. stars. The dimmer, cooler, red A common stars. mnemonic for remembering the order of the classification is, Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. But I like this mnemonic better. 
like oh this boy, an F grade kills me. Oh boy, an F grade kills me. According to the modern spectral classification system, O stars are blue, B stars are blue white, A stars are white, F stars are yellow white, G stars are yellow, K stars are orange, K stars are orange. M stars These are categories of stars can These also be broken down into tenths by giving them a number of 0 to 9. So an A5 star is 5 so tenths five between an A star and an F star. An star and class an O star. stars are very hot, bright, are and look bluish. Hot. And the class bluish. O star is very the rare. Star Only very about rare. .00003% of main sequence stars are O stars. These are also some of the brightest, These most massive stars in the sky, shining with over a million times the power of our sun. Class B stars are very bright and blue. These stars are short-lived, so they don't travel far from where they are born. There are few of these class B stars, only about .13% of all stars. Of class A stars. stars are white or class bluish white. Stars are white about .625% of the stars in the sky are class A. Class F stars are white and make up about 3% of stars. Class G stars are yellowish white. Our sun is a class G star. These stars are more common, about 7.5% of stars. Class K stars are orange stars that are slightly cooler than the sun. They make up about 12% of stars. Class M M stars are the most common class, class stars are about 76.02% of stars. We can't stars. see any class M stars with their naked eye, though, because none of them are bright enough. Most class M stars are red dwarfs, but there are also some giants and supergiants in this class, along with some hotter brown dwarfs. Scientists classify stars by their Scientists color and temperature into seven categories. The O stars are the brightest and hottest, and the M stars are the coolest and dimmest. The easiest way to remember the categories in order is with a mnemonic such as, Oh boy, an F grade kills me. This spectral classification tells scientists a lot about a star, including the approximate size of the star, what type it is, how old it is, and how far away it is. Class O stars look bluish. Only about .00003% of main sequence stars are O stars. Class B stars are very bright and blue. There are few of these class B stars, only about .13% of all stars. Class A stars are white or bluish white. About .625% of the stars in the sky are class A. Class F stars are white and make up about 3% of stars. Class G stars are yellowish white. These stars are more common, about 7.5% of stars. Class K stars are orange stars. They make up about 12% of stars. Class M stars are the most common class, about 76.02% of stars. Okay, so that basically explained the different colors dealing with temperature. The more blue a star is going to appear, the hotter it's going to be, the more red it's going to be, the cooler it's going to be. Uh, this was similar to what your spectro gizmo looked like on Friday. Uh, if you need to finish that, make sure you get that done here soon. Uh, it'll be due, it should be due today, but if you need an extra day, that's fine. Um, but that's kind of what it was talking about, the different spectrum, and depending on which color it leaned towards, uh, would show how hot or cold something would be. Okay, uh, then we talk about the action of a prism. So when we pass a beam of white sunlight through a prism, we see a rainbow colored band of light that we call it the continuous spectrum. So what's happening is a beam of sunlight comes through, and again, that's considered white light, comes through, bends through a prism, and shows as the continuous spectrum, also known as what we call the rainbow. So the light is refracted or bent through this prism. It expands the wavelengths to be able to view the actual colors. So that is, if you ever seen the band Pink Floyd, that's what their album cover looks like, is the bending of the light prism through. And what's happening is the light beam goes through the prism and it slows down. When it slows down, it allows for the separation of wavelengths. And then it'll show the shorter wavelengths towards the bottom, the more red violet or the more violet uh, purple colors towards the bottom, the longer wavelengths are going to be through the top because they took longer to be able to travel through the actual prism itself. So we can see that anytime you see a rainbow coming off, that's what's happening is that light is being refracted 
or bent, causing the spectrum to appear. Uh, the continuous spectrum is when light, light, white light passes through a prism. It is dispersed and forms a continuous spectrum of all colors. Although it is hard to see in this printed version, it is well dispersed spectrum. Many gentle gradations in color are visible as the eye scan from one end, violet, to the other end of red. So we start from left to right. You can see that gradual change across the spectrum. And we can see it switch from purple to indigo to blue to blue green to green to yellow to orange and kind of pinky they get into red and then goes even darker into black and again it starts on black on both sides because of how the light is being absorbed at that point so we can see that gentle gradual spectrum continue all the way across uh, tomorrow we're going to do a spectroscope lab and you're actually going to be able to see the continuous spectrum looking at uh, white light from the sunlight. Okay, you can go through and watch this video later. Uh, it's just a crash course astronomy video. I won't bore you with that. Uh, we're also going to talk about the visible spectrum of the sun. So our star spectrum is crossed by dark lines produced by atoms in the solar system that absorbs light at a certain wavelength. So every single one of these dark lines in this picture here are what we call absorption lines. So lines that are absorbing the sunlight and it shows different elements being expressed. So again, in that spectra video or spectra gizmo that you were working on on Friday, those lines that were showing up, those were lines being absorbed. So we're taking in those atoms and it shows certain elements being expressed at certain times. And again, we're gonna be able to see that tomorrow when we look at certain elements in the spectroscope. We also have the continuous spectrum and line spectra from different elements. So each type of glowing gas, so each element produces its own unique pattern of lines. So the composition of a gas can be identified by its spectra. The spectra of sodium, hydrogen, calcium, and mercury gases are shown here. So we could see down below that depending on what element you're dealing with is what lines you're going to actually view. So again, the top one is a very, is a continuous spectrum. So all is going to be shown. Sodium shows a little bit of blue, yellow, green, yellow, and one orange. Hydrogen shows a little more towards the purple blue side with one red. Calcium shows a whole bunch of the spectrum and so does mercury, but in different sections. So what happens a lot is when we look at different stars and things like that, we can actually compare these spectrum lines that are being shown to figure out what type of elements or gases are produced. So since we already know, based on what's known here on Earth, we can compare them to others and say, okay, this one has hydrogen in its atmosphere and this one has mercury or calcium based off these spectral lines that are given to us. Okay, so we have types of spectra. So we have the continuous spectrum forms from a de very dense fog or a solid given off radiation. So here we can see we have the light bulb, which is our source of light, goes through a lens. It goes through that narrow slit to be able to condense the light beam in. It breaks through the prism and we can see the light bend. It goes through another lens to then focus into the continuous spectrum. So we can see that kind of breaking and bending of light opens it up and allows us to see that complete spectrum. If we did the other way, a low density of get hot gas creates emission lines and a cool thin gas creates dark absorption lines. So if something is has a low density is very hot, what we're gonna see is the continuous spectrum with dark lines in it because something is being absorbed at that point. If it's a cool thin gas, what we're gonna notice is the whole thing is going to be black with certain colors represented through it, which are the admission lines. And um, we'll also talk about that tomorrow as well. Um, when we talk about rainbows though, so rainbow refraction, the diagram shows how, long, how light from the sun, which is located behind the observer, can be refracted by raindrops to produce a rainbow. So refraction separates the white light into the composite colors. So when we see a rainbow, what we are seeing is the light rays from the sun being refracted and causing what we view to be this uh, rainbow. We can see that when we're dealing with a hose. We can see that when we deal with any sort of water 
If we stand at the correct angle where the sun is behind us, we will be able to view a rainbow. And we know it's not a physical thing, it's just light being reflected off of raindrops. Okay, uh, then we get into the hydrogen atom. So this is a diagram of a hydrogen atom in its lowest energy state, which we call the ground state. Uh, the photon and the electron have equal but opposite charges, which exert an electromagnetic force that binds the hydrogen atom together. And the illustration, the size of the particular, it's exaggerated, um, but it's just showing how the electron and proton are still away from each other and they are showing opposite charges, making a magnetic field. Helium on this diagram has its lowest energy state. So this would be its ground state. We have two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. And it has nearly the same mass as a proton but carry no charge, which is just a neutron. So again, it's electrically neutral. The two electrons orbit the nucleus. Again, this is just kind of a repeated chemistry. Um, protons, neutrons found in the middle. Electrons are found on the outside. Okay, we can also talk about isotopes of hydrogen. So a single proton in the nucleus defines the atom to be hydrogen, but there may be zero, one, or two neutrons. The most common isotope of hydrogen is one that only a single proton and no neutrons. So we have what's called isotopes. Isotopes is when we have the same number of protons in every atom, because if we change the number of protons, we're really changing the type of atom we're dealing with. It's when we change the number of neutrons. Those neutrons, again, don't affect the overall charge of the atom. All it's doing is changing the overall mass of it. Okay, so we also talk about uh, Niels Bohr and Max Planck. So Bohr came up with the idea of the Bohr's model, which was basically this atom here, where we had the protons and neutrons in the middle, and then we had these orbitals that the electrons orbited around. And then Planck talked about how energy and how those photons behaved within that energy. Okay, this guy does a really nice job explaining the Bohr's atom dealing with Planck as well and how they jump energy levels based on how much energy they have and then what happens when they crash back down. <laughs> Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is AP Physics, Physics Essential Physics Video 4. It's on the atom. In the last video, we talked about how Ernest Rutherford and his gold foil experiment had helped scientists discover this positive small nucleus in the center of an atom. But that didn't tell us what the electrons were doing. Uh, and he just speculated that they were moving around the nucleus almost like planets in orbit around the sun. But one of the researchers working underneath Rutherford, Niels Bohr, spotted a problem in this. He knew that any charged particle that it's moving is going to be giving off electromagnetic radiation. As it does that, it's losing some of that energy, and so it's going to quickly spiral into the middle and annihilate essentially the whole atom. So he knew that wasn't right. He also knew that as it gives off radiation, the wavelength of that radiation is going to vary. And as it varies, we're going to get this nice smooth spectrum, spectrum of electromagnetic radiation given off by high energy atoms. But when we started to look into space, what we found is that light wasn't smooth. It had these discrete units within it. And so that spectra had to be described. And Bohr's model helped to do that. And so if you think of it like this, and this works for hydrogen, is what the Bohr, Bohr model is built on, you have these energy levels. And so an electron can be in energy level 1, energy level 2, energy level 3, but it can never be found in the middle. It's quantized. It has to be in one of those levels or another level. And so what, how does it move between levels? Well, if it absorbs energy from a photon, electromagnetic radiation, for example, it'll jump to a higher level. And as it moves down, it's going to emit those photons. And that helped to describe what we, what we were seeing in the spectra. And so that improved our model. So we ha now had the cloud uh, that had the electrons in it and then the nucleus. And so we found these negative electrons in the cloud. And then protons and neutrons were found in the nucleus. And in a neutral atom, the number of protons and electrons are going to be equal. And the electrons tell us a lot about the properties of that atom. In fact, the whole periodic table is built on the electrons. Electrons especially we have in these outer levels. 
Now, the Bohr model helps us explain what those electrons are doing and how they're moving. They move into these discrete energy states, and that helps us to explain the spectra. And so if you look at any kind of an atom on the periodic table, the atomic number 2 tells us the number of protons we have. And so we're going to have these positive protons that are going to be found in the nucleus. We can kind of figure out how many neutrons roughly we're going to have in an average atom by taking the mass number, subtracting the atomic number, and so we would know in helium, for example, that we're going to have two neutrons. Now, since the number of protons and electrons are the same in a neutral atom, we can figure out that we've got these electrons moving around the outside. And the number of electrons that we have out there tell us a lot about the properties of the atom. And so if you look at the periodic table, this whole thing is essentially built on the number of electrons that we have because that tells us a lot about the properties. And so if you look right here, we'll find copper, silver, and gold, which are all very similar, are in the same column. And that essentially says that they have similar outer level electrons. Or if we look in the first column, all of these are highly re reactive, all the noble gases are not, and so the properties of atoms are built on those electrons. But there were problems with this planetary model. Um, electrons weren't orbiting like uh, planets. They were actually jumping between orbits, according to Niels Bohr. And so they didn't just move back and forth on all these infinite number of orbits around the nucleus, giving off a smooth amount of spectrum, almost like a ladder, that an electron could be here, but it could also be here. And it could never be found in the middle. We call that being quantized. It has to be in a specific unit uh, to exist. Now, how do you move an electron to a farther level? Well, you have to put a little bit of energy into it. So if we add a lot of energy, we could jump it up, up to this energy level. And as it falls back down, it's going to release a certain amount of energy. And so this is a visual or a model of what the Bohr model might look like. And so as it orbits around the center, if it receives a photon, it jumps to a higher level. If it gives off an equal photon, it'll drop down to a lower level. And so it's only existing in these quantized orbits. And this helped to explain spectra, because before the model uh, was discovered or, or was put forth, they, people had started discovering spectra. They were looking into space, not with just a prism, but a spectroscope. So they were splitting the light into all of its different wavelengths, and they were starting to see these lines. So when you're looking at the sun, for example, which is mostly hydrogen, we saw these different series. So the Lyman series was developed by one scientist who was using spectroscopy, and he came up with an equation that explained what was going on, but you couldn't see this spectra because it was into ultraviolet. Uh, we also the, saw the Passion series that was uh, showing the similar relationship, but this was in the infrared, and the Balmer series was seeing the same thing. And so what really he was explaining, let's throw the Balmer series up here, is that they were seeing these discrete units of light. And so where was that light coming from? If you look at hydrogen, well, you can see here as we move from this energy level 2 up to energy level 3, it requires a certain amount of energy. And as the electron falls back down, it's going to give off that energy. It's going to give off that light. And so the Bohr model predicted what these numbers were, and they fit perfectly with the numbers that we were seeing uh, in the spectra. And so again, this only works for hydrogen, and so it's a good step model, or it's a good model to get you started on understanding how the atom is really put together. But did you learn the energy level structure of an electron in an atom at the appropriate scale being investigated? In this case, it's at these energy levels in hydrogen atom. I hope so. That's the Bohr model, and I hope that was helpful. Okay, so what that was basically explaining is that the hydrogen atom was shown in a very simplified way in these centric circles that represent uh, permanent orbits or energy levels. An uh, electron in a hydrogen atom can only exist in one of these energy levels or states. Uh, the closer the electron is to the nucleus, the more tightly bound to the electron it is to the nucleus. By absorbing energy, the electron can move up energy levels further from the nucleus and then can eventually escape it if it has enough energy is, is absorbed. So to be able to move energy levels or to move rings, the electron would need to be able to absorb energy. So it would absorb these energies and then when it needed to drop back down, it would need to release that energy. When it released that energy, it released it in a form of light. And depending on how much energy was actually released is going to dictate what color or what form of light is going to be released and that allowed us to see certain lines in the spectra. So we could see here, depending on which series you were, you were looking at, you could see 
they often follow the same kind of idea. So here we're following the emission or absorption of photons by a hydrogen atom according to the Bohr's model. Uh, several different series of the spectral lines are shown corresponding to the transition of electrons from one or from or to a certain allowing orbit. Uh, each series of lines that terminates or a specific inner orbit is named from a, a physicist who studied it. At the top, for example, is the Balmer series. Uh, the arrows show the electron jumping from the second orbit to the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth orbits. Each time a poor electron forms a lower energy, wants to release a higher portion in life, in life, it must absorb energy to do so. So to be able to be able to jump from one energy level to the next, it needs to be able to absorb energy as it goes uh, before it can move up to the next energy level. So it can absorb energy it needs in passing waves of photons of light. The next set of arrows is the Lyman series, showing the electrons falling down to the first orbit from a different or higher energy level. Uh, each time a rich electron goes downwards towards the nucleus, it can afford or it can afford to give off or emit some energy it no longer needs. So it's going to drop down, and when it emits light, it's going to release it, and then that allows us to see certain light. So basically, they said the same thing, just looked at it a little bit differently. Uh, and so depending on if it needs to go up an energy level, it needs to absorb energy. If it's going to drop an energy level, it needs to release energy or those photons out. So as the higher and higher energy levels, the levels become more and more crowded together and approaching a limit. The region at the top line represents energies at which the top or the atom is ionized. So the electron is no longer attached to the atom. So that means it's either gained or lost an electron. Um, each series of arrows represents an electron falling from a higher energy level to a lower one, releasing photons or waves of energy in the process. So basically they're gonna fall back down and when they fall back down, they have to release energy in some way, shape or form, whether it's a photon or a wave of energy. So here's kind of a quick picture showing it drop and that delta E is just showing that the height divided by the frequency is releasing a sort of light or photon out and into the environment that allows us to see a certain color. All right, so that's all I got for notes today. You do have homework. That's your Digia quiz number five due next Monday because your test is next Tuesday, uh, 10 24. So make sure you get that done. If you have any questions, let me know. It's all posted on Google Classroom um, as of this morning. Um, and then also make sure you get your gizmo done. If you need help with that, come see me tomorrow morning or we can quickly review before our lab. But um, if you have questions, shoot me a quick email. I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. Have a great rest of your day and I will see you tomorrow.